All right. So, you know, I, when I when I sent in my title, you know, I, I wasn't sure what to what what to give as a title. So I gave this one as a title. What I really wanted to use as my title was uh, the impact of black holes on cosmic structures. What are they really good for? And you know, in the theorist community, this is sort of borderline heresy. But uh, now, Meg's talk yesterday sort of I thought was going to go in the opposite direction and, and went has gone along in the direction that I'm going to continue. And I've been talking to Tommaso and virtually everybody who's been speaking at the Outflows conference and, and uh, even in Aison Provence where Francois Combs was discussing the latest uh, molecular outflows from ALMA results. Uh, Everybody seems, to, you know, at least when I speak to the observers, they say they shrug their shoulders and say, huh, "What are you saying? That's new." So this is, uh, you know, so th this is something that the theorists need to start worrying about. And uh, I have several topics, so I, I am going to talk about AGN feedback in clusters. But what I really, what I wanted to start off with was uh, continue the conversation that we were having yesterday, which is, you know, uh, what is the impact of uh, feedback on galaxies? Uh, and we've all seen this plot or variants of it, this one uh, Andrew sent me a few years ago, which essentially shows that if you try and match, the curves are, uh, I think the Andrew's curve is actually a little lower and, and makes a tangent with the knee of the luminosity function. But essentially the picture is that if you try and take the dark matter halos and put constant mass to light ratios, you essentially miss this very sharp turnoff. And, and that's where uh, AGN feedback was invoked in order to shut down uh, star formation. But then, as you know, that was the original motivation. But along the way, the original motivation got lost. And AGN feedback and quasars and, and whatnot just became the be all and end all, the catch that, that basically took care of every problem we had, which included the fact that we didn't know how to do star formation well in the, in the, in the simulations, right? So we screwed up star formation. Couldn't you know figure out how to solve it easily? I'm talking now. When when were you at Washington? We're talking 15, 20 years now, right? So if, you know, 15, 20 years ago, when the resolution was poor and computing power was hard to come by, and you know subgrid physics was a mess. It still is a mess, but it's getting better. Uh, you know, we solved the problem by invoking AGN feedback. I actually, I have papers that invoke AGN feedback 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, in simulations. We, we showed that simulations failed miserably, and the only power source we could come up with to explain what we were missing was AGN feedback. Now, we didn't implement AGN feedback, but the reason we didn't implement it is Neil Katz and I, no, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a good historical lesson. Neil Katz and I had just gotten tenured at that point. And so we decided we didn't need to publish any more papers just claiming results. We were actually going to solve the problem. It took us 15 years. We're only now starting to get to a point where we think we can we can model it correctly, and and so you know um, we stopped doing simulations at that point because of that. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah, so, so, that's, so that gets, that, that's exactly what I was saying, right? So we couldn't do star formation well back then, right? The resolution was too poor. You know, we didn't have this uh, delimiters that Fabrice invented and, and, you know, to get the set-off phase correctly. And so we were dumping energy in the wrong place. It was radiating away. And we couldn't solve that problem. So what did we do? We invoked the next best thing, right? I mean, that is the history of this of this field. It, it is sort of writing itself now. I don't know. I mean, you could also say that if you still have it, yeah, you know, I mean, it's very there, so... Let, let, me, let me get... So, no, it's not true that you just have to it to... No, no, but it doesn't need to be invoked before we invoked it to even capture smaller galaxies. And, and it doesn't need to be invoked to capture smaller... Uh, Milky Way-like galaxies. We don't care now, right? And so, Andrew... I've been working with Andrew on, on Galacticus, and uh, uh, just a couple of days ago, in fact, uh, Andrew um, made some runs with no AGN feedback. So this was a run where AGN feedback was started. I should introduce Andrew Benson, who's uh, visiting here. Um, 
and Fabrice Duria, whose plot I will show in a second, uh, who's joined us for the workshop and will be here for the rest of the, the duration. Um, so this is a, a, a run showing the luminosity function, the uh, black hole mass, bulge stellar mass relationship, and the global star formation history, amongst others. No, this is, so, this is semi analytics I'll show you simulations in a minute. And you can see that you know, with star formation prescriptions, you can now get everything until the, uh, uh, up to the knee. The stellar mass for coming from the, from the workshop over the last couple of days, right? So you can see in the black hole mass relationship, you're, you start to sort of mess up right here where the stellar masses are about 10 to the 10 solar masses, which is roughly 10 to the 12 solar mass halos, right? which is exactly where everybody was showing in the workshop things were starting to get messed up. Right? Uh, so you have this break right there. And the global star formation history, you know, higher than redshifts 2 or even 1.5, looks perfectly reasonable without AGN feedback. Uh, it's only at the lower redshifts that you start to overproduce. And I didn't show the other plots that Andrew uh, sent me, which, you know, agrees with which sort of went along in the same direction you mentioned, that if you don't have that, then your elliptical galaxies become really blue and really massive, and they don't look red and dead. Now, that, is, that, that, that was you know, semi-analytic work, and so you can critique it. It's saying that you know, somehow there's a prescription of physics. This is stuff that Fabrice has been working on, where he's taken everybody and their grandmother's prescription for star formation, and various different prescriptions for feedback, and one after another. Uh, and you're looking at the global star formation history, and you see that you capture the turnover. It messes up right about here in the same way that it was messing up in Andrew's simulations, where in groups and in clusters, you are cooling out more gas than you need to, or you ought to, and uh, you're forming stars, and the galaxies are becoming bluer. But generally speaking, star formation seems to do just fine. High redshift quasars at, 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 at redshifts, uh, you know, two and higher don't seem to be doing much in this picture, or at least you don't need to invoke it. Now, you, they may happen in rare cases like mergers where you might get some blowout, but there's no AGN feedback here. There's, there's just star formation, and these are simulations. So the question is, what exactly is happening uh, in those large elliptical galaxies? And you know, we heard a little bit of discussion about this yesterday, that uh, as you're transitioning from cold mode to hot mode, you're starting to build up a hot diffuse halo. And the point is that for galaxies like Milky Way M31, the stellar feedback is sufficient to moderate star formation. This goes along in the same way that Phil Hopkins and Norm Murray and company have been describing. You have roughly a Q1 uh, disk. Star formation is doing its job. You launch winds. You have galactic outflows that are la launched by star formation. You can disperse the metals just fine with those winds, as Fabrice, uh, uh, if, if he's I guess at some point over the next uh, four weeks, you'll be, we'll be mentioning this. Um, you can disperse the metals just fine. But basically, it's when you start getting the hot halo gas building up, that's when the problem starts arising. <clears throat> and this hot halo gas impacts galaxy evolution in two ways. And, and this sort of now is, is transitioning towards the clusters and group discussion because these are the systems where you are. You, you happen to be, you have an elliptical galaxy at centers of groups and clusters. There's a lot of hot gas sitting around. And the problem with this hot gas is that uh, if you do nothing with it, it'll cool really fast. And it'll cool and collect in the central galaxy and start to create problems. You will have blue central galaxies. There are other things that uh, that, that, that this hot halo will do, uh, ram pressure stripping, star from, and, and et cetera, but I'm not going to really focus on that. I'm going to worry about this cooling and pooling bit. And for, the, you know, for most of the discussion from now on, I will sort of focus on clusters, although what I say is equally relevant for groups. Um, and for Meg, I have decided, I've changed some of my nomenclature. 
Um, I'm, I, I call this the quasar mode, and uh, this was the radio mode, but since Meg hates the word radio mode, um, I, I've decided to use radiatively inefficient and radiatively efficient situation. And the question is, you know, it doesn't appear to be the, uh, that this, this mode uh, that shouldn't, sorry, that's not radiatively efficient is the AGN, is, is not, so. what I'm trying to say here is that the radiatively efficient mode doesn't appear to be doing a thing for AGN feedback. And if you're trying to affect the hot halo gas, it's the radiatively inefficient modes where you actually do see jets. So, you know, in, in, the, in the situation here, the, the normal radiatively efficient modes where the Eddington luminosities are in this range typically are supposed to have weak jets, at least from, from arguments that uh, uh, various people, including McKinney and company and uh, Mayer and company have made. And then it's the radiatively inefficient modes with luminosities that are much lower that have strong jets. These are the kinds of systems that we do see in groups and clusters of galaxies. There is a third category, which uh, I guess that you, know, you mentioned in your talk, uh, which is the border, which are exceeding 0.3 in Eddington and are getting radiatively pressure supported and geometrically thick and potentially could be luminous and jet launching. Uh, but I'm assuming that those are rare cases. Uh, certainly in clusters, we don't see those, those, those situations. We, we tend to see these kinds of uh, systems uh, virtually everywhere in situations where there is potential gas flows. So turning to galaxy clusters, you know, interestingly enough, I was mentioning this to somebody yesterday uh, as we were walking over to lunch. And this sort of goes along the discussion we started off this morning. When I was a grad student, the uh, ROSAT hadn't started to release their data yet. So we had Einstein X-ray data, which was poor resolution. And then we had Neil Katz and Gus Everard who had done their numerical simulations. The very first cosmological SPH simulations had just been done. And there was no cooling. And they'd done clusters of galaxies. So here you had images of uh, the X-ray radiation, X-ray, uh, mock X-ray images of clusters with no cooling. Here you had poor resolution Chandra images, and you compared the two and they looked identical. Einstein, sorry, yeah. And, and they looked identical. And so the, the, the claim was that the clusters have been sold. And in fact, this is one reason why I didn't end up doing my thesis on clusters. Um, of course, we all know the history, right? As the resolution improved on the observations, things went awry. As we put in the next level of physics in the, in the clusters, uh, simulations, cooling, uh, because we do see cooling radiation, things really went awry. And so, and, and, and the problem hasn't been solved. Clusters are an, an open game right now. What we do know from clusters is that there is a, 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 a you could argue that there is a, a a, a, a very broad distribution, but if you look at results like uh, the kind that Ken Cavagnolo is showing, there seems to be a bimodality of some sort. Um, Al Sanderson at Birmingham has also uh, found similar things. I'll show you a picture in a minute by what I mean, but there is this two kinds of clusters. There are cool core and non-cool core clusters. And one of the questions that, that, that is still open and needs to be um, elaborated on is, what is the role, if any, uh, of AGNs in setting up this dichotomy? When did this dichotomy emerge? How did this dichotomy emerge? Then we have the cool core clusters, where the cooling times in the central regions really are short. These are the systems where we do see radio jets and, and bubbles in x-rays. And the question there is in trying to understand how the jets are affecting the, the intracluster medium. Um, what, what exactly is the mechanism? How is this happening? And one of the sort of a, a, a fly in the ointment of all simple pictures is the isotropy problem. Jets are relatively narrow. Um, with Hank Hoekstra and Andy Madawi, we had uh, compiled a, a sample of clusters where we've been, we've been doing weak lensing measurements, x-ray measurements, trying to understand correlations, trying to do hydrostatic equilibrium, trying to understand various aspects of clusters. And in that sample, we ended up with one cluster 
It's a Redshift point four cluster uh, that has, and I should. So th these are so some of the list of papers that that uh, that I'm going to be touching upon as I go through. But the three that I would like to emphasize is this one uh, by Ewan O'Sullivan, which looks at this particular uh, cluster. It's an IRA source. It's a Hylerg in the BCG of a cluster. So it's at the center of a cluster. It's a quasar. It's an obscured quasar. It has a radio jet when you look at it. And uh, the question is, what's going on? It has a radio jet. It's a quasar. It's an obscured quasar. Uh, you know, what it, this is actually represents itself as a nice place to try and look at what kind of feedback the luminous quasar mode is doing. Uh, we have a tracer particle, right? We have a hot halo, hot X-ray gas around, which we could image through with Chandra. And, and there's a potential to see shocks if there are these powerful winds being blown out of the system. So I'll mention that a little bit. There's this work by Chris Haynes and, 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 and that looks at a cluster environment and, and looks at the, um, the distribution of X-ray AGNs in local clusters, which sort of relates back to some of the discussion we were having yesterday. You were talking about galaxies. I had mentioned that galaxies quench. He's done work on galaxies and the quenching of galaxies. And this is sort of the counterpart to that of, of what happens to AGNs as galaxies fall into clusters. And then there's this work that uh, Chris Reynolds, uh, Pratik Sharma, and I uh, have done on trying to uh, come up with a solution to the, the isotropy problem. So this is the entropy profiles of the intracluster gas. And uh, what I mean by entropy is this ratio. So basically, temperature over density to the 2 thirds. It's a proxy for the thermodynamic entropy. And it's something that is easily measurable from x-ray observations. And the first thing to note is that if you look at the entropy profiles, they span a huge range in central values. They all converge at large values to a, a self-similar scaling. So at large radii, they all behave as you would expect, where the gas is being gravitationally shock heated and their entropy is essentially uh, consistent with that. But in the very centers, they have this huge spread where you have systems with entropies. In fact, more recently, there are entropies that are going right down to 1. And at the high end, you have entropies that are going up to 600. Ken Cavagnolo uh, made a histogram of the distribution and found that there is this bimodality uh, in, the, in the Chandra archive. Now, Chandra archive wasn't a homogeneous sample, so there was some criticism made of that. But uh, uh, several other groups, including Al Sanderson at Birmingham, have repeated this. And they also find uh, evidence of this bimodality. I, I actually am agnostic at this point about the bimodality. And I don't want to necessarily uh, distract your attention with the bimodality. But what I do want to mention is that you can essentially draw lines in this plot and ask the question, what is the cooling time in the central region? So something like at about 40 kiloparsecs, what is the cooling time of the gas? And anything with a central entropy less than 30 has a cooling time of uh, less than a giga year. And things at central entropies of about 100 have a cooling time of about 5 giga years. And of course, anything that has and central entropies higher than that have much longer cooling time. And this is, you know, in the in the olden days when we were hearing about cool uh, cl uh, massive cooling flow clusters, the massive cooling flow clusters are clusters that tend to sit in this zone right here. They have cooling times that are less than a giga year. And you can divide this sample further. No. The central entropy does not appear to correlate with mass. Uh, it doesn't appear to correlate. There, the only thing that it does correlate with is that in the systems that are cool cores, the BCGs tend to be sitting in the center. Here, it's a complete heterogeneous sample. Some of them are mergers. And they're disturbed systems. So making this kind of a plot is nonsensical for them. But there are also completely relaxed cool core clusters, uh, non-cool core clusters that just you know, ought to be. 
previously, as I'll show you, the ar argument was that these are the relaxed systems and these are all disturbed systems. But that picture just doesn't hold. And then the next picture was, well, these are the systems with, uh, you know, that everything wants to be over here, but then once in a while you have this massive explosion of, a, of the AGN and it kicks it up here. That doesn't work either. So just to give you an idea of what fraction, the cool core clusters make up about 40% of the total population. The non-cool core clusters make up 45%. Again, and there's a gap in between that makes up the, the difference. And the non-cool core clusters have core entropies of, of 200 to 300 in, in this particular parameter, K. And one of the big challenges is how do we get values that high? This is, this is a, a very difficult problem. I mean, when we do numerical simulations uh, and you don't have AGN feedback, you find that the central entropy, as we've already alluded to in, in the earlier part, the central, uh, the gas cools very rapidly in the center and dumps all that gas into the central galaxy. You end up with uh, density profiles that are spiking, gas is moving in, 30% uh, in a cluster, 30% 30, 30 of the baryons turns into stars in the central galaxy. This is big blue uh, elliptical in the center. If you put AGN feedback, and this is where it gets interesting, depends on how you put AGN feedback. I can stop this if I put a huge bomb in there. But I don't see a huge bomb in the data. And therein lies the problem. What we do see in the data are radio jets. Now, we, uh, we, you know, Lucio asked this question as to what if I had these cool core clusters and I wanted to convert them into, into non-cool core clusters? There, are two, there were two uh, um, options, two possibilities that were on the market. One is I take two massive clusters with cool cores and I smash them together and bingo, I will arrive with a non-cool core cluster in the center. It turns out that, well, you can work out the energetics and it doesn't work. But since that was not convincing, we actually went ahead and did a simulation. Uh, we had impact parameters with distribution of velocities. And sure enough, the dense cold cores in the two cool core clusters are robust. And as Lucio is also finding in the galaxy simulations, they quickly you know, spiral in dynamical friction. They merge in the center, and they form a robust cool core system. And the whole thing lasts about two to three gig years, and then you have a roaring cool core cluster right back again. So mergers, at least mergers, once the clusters have established themselves and have become cool cores, ain't going to do anything. So the other picture was that you had these massive bones going off in the center. and so. Um, Ian McCarthy and uh, Richard Bauer and I, uh, we, we've been working on a series of papers on, 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 on clusters and trying to understand the central entropy problem. And one of the calculations we, we did was, well, what happens when you do have a bomb? Just what kind of a bomb do you really need? And it turns out that if you want to transform a cool core system into a non-cool core system with not an entropy of 200, just an entropy of 100, you require greater than 10 to the 63 ergs of energy, of, uh, uh, of energy, which converts into a power of 10 to the 47 to 10 to the 48 ergs per second, which means that if you're doing this with a black hole and your efficiency factor is about 0.1, in a single event, you're feeding greater than 5 times 10 to the 9 solar masses into the black hole. Now, you know, that has a problem of its own. If you just go back and compare these numbers to what you see in, in observations, you find that this power output is between 10 to 100 times the largest, most powerful bang we've ever seen in a cluster. And there are only two of them. Sorry, this is power. How long time to achieve these 10 to the 8. Yes. Yeah, that's right. We were trying to be conservative. You shorten the lifetime, the power just blows up, right? So we were trying to be, uh, trying to be. Uh, we took the values for time scales which were as conservative as possible from from literature. Does it have just for 
part of transit goes straight to the energy, right? Yeah. And, and, and the most powerful explosions we've seen, this is a picture of one of them, which Brian McNamara has made very famous. It's MSO735. The other one is a Hercules A. And for these guys, as I mentioned, this explosion is, is about 100, uh, 100 to 50 times weaker than the power outputs that we need. And of course, because we have x-ray data on this, you can go ahead and ask, what is the central entropy post-explosion? And it makes a tiny little change. It goes up, you know, it's gone up to about 20. Nowhere near 100. And, you know, in, in, we had a lot of trouble with the referee trying to get this through. And ultimately, I think what won the day was the fact that we, we pointed out to the referee that if you took an atomic bomb and you did an atmospheric test, the blast expands to a large radii, but if you did an uh, underwater test, the blast is much more contained. And we you know, worked this through with the referee that what you're really doing, most of the energy is actually going into lifting the water. You have a huge column of water on top of you. You're blasting this. You're not really heating the gas up. You're spending more energy actually doing gravitation, working against the gravitational potential. And so, if you're sitting at the bottom of a, of, of a cluster, I think the number was something like 80% of the energy was just going into redistributing the gas into a more uh, less centrally concentrated distribution. The temperatures, the gas essentially um, uh, will expand out so that its temperature really goes back to something of order the virial temperature of the of the cluster. Although it's it's right here, it's the, this energy will thermalize somehow. So what happens to it? Yeah, so if, if you, if you uh, so the energy does thermalize, but you have a, a, a broader distribution, uh, um, less dense distribution. So you're moving gas out and then thermalizing it and keeping it pressure supported at further radii. Is that the same as having K increase? No, so the, the, you're, if you, you know, because you're driving the density down, your temperature is not going as far up as you need, want it to go up. So you could put in a lot of high temperature gas in the center, but as it expands, it is expanding, you know, in the simplest case, it's expanding adiabatically, the temperature is going down, but the pressure, the, the, the entropy of the gas is remaining the same, and the pressure is essentially... It's overloaded to the gamma, you have the same pressure, less density, gamma is there larger than one, you are, you have less, uh, more. But there is a change. There is a change in there is a change in temperature, but the change in temperature is marginal when you try and detect it. Although uh, I mean, I agree that five yeah. seven nine solar masses. That, that, that's where you had me. Yeah. But if you're comparing this to these two particular systems, now you multiply that entropy jump by a factor of a hundred because you've got a hundred times the bang. It doesn't seem implausible to get to one hundred or two hundred for your entropy. You're getting ten or something for this. No, that's right. You get a lot, but you want to do this in 50% of the clusters. That's fine, but I mean the the fact that Hercules mm. A and this MS system, which are little pipsqueaks by comparison to what you need, don't do very much, doesn't necessarily. Add fair enough. No, fair fair point. Yeah. So that was one of the main arguments in the paper. If you're doing that by 100, you're basically growing your black hole. Yeah. Many times over. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. Uh, it's not just the entropy, it's the density. No, so, uh, right over here so you can see it. So the, the, the density profile for a, a cool core cluster essentially does something like that. This is the gas. This is the gas. <coughs> and for the non-cool core systems, they tend to sort of uh, flatten out. And the temperature profiles for the for the non for the cool core clusters, do something like that, and for the non cool core clusters, there's a huge sort of variation, something like that. So there is a difference in their temperature profiles. There's a difference in their entropy profiles. But this temperature tends to be of order the virial temperature of the of the halo. So it tends to be isothermal in the center or nearly isothermal like. 
So you are heating the gas, it's just that you're not. Yeah, that's a different, that, that, that makes it even harder. Right? You can, you can, we, we did this in multiple ways. We did this uh, central bombs. We did this uh, uh, distributed heating out. What you find is that if you don't get your heating out to at least 300 kiloparsecs, you cool the gas out there and it just crushes in again. So that, that's another problem with the clusters is that, for, you know, in addition to getting the two populations or getting this huge distribution of entropies, uh, Solving the problem in the center is one problem. Is in, even in a cool core cluster, solving the problem in the center is one half of the problem. Solving the problem at, two, at 100 to 300 kiloparsecs is yet another problem in its own right. And that relates to what you're saying, getting the energy out there. So we're asking a lot from an, AG, from, from an AGN. Oh. So you know, I'm not going to talk very much. I'm, I'm just going to skip over this. Uh, the, the main point here is that you know, 15 years down the road, the origin of the entropy cluster, of the entropy structure in clusters, uh, remains unexplained. And and remember, from what I've argued, this suggests that whatever's happening has to be happening before the cluster is starting to form. Because if you don't take care of it before the cluster forms, you're sort of in trouble from that point on. And we see that. Uh, we see simulations that. Uh, uh, Bookwine and company have done with clusters where they uh, they have to either destroy their galaxies altogether, they have to do such a violent thing in the beginning to get the cluster right, or they do clusters right, but they still go through this oscillation phase where you have tremendous amount of gas still cooling out in the center and, and stars forming like crazy. So this may jump to something you're going to suggest, but Along the same line that Meg was telling us about the and the dips, could you imagine that the cool clusters are the ones that have had only minor mergers with other clusters and the non-cools that have major so mergers? So that was a slide I sort of uh, missed out. Uh, there, are, there are two, I guess if you wanted to uh, boil it down, there are, there are two variables that, that one needs to play with. One is the, hier the actual hierarchical buildup of the clusters must be playing a role. Yeah. The second is, and so yeah, the, you could imagine that they are situations that are playing, uh, that, that could be cases of minor mergers. But mergers by itself does not do anything, right? We've done lots of simulations where we don't have AGN feedback and no matter what the merger history is, Gas cools efficiently in the center, and, and I mean mergers between clusters. Yeah, yeah, we're we're talking about mergers between clusters. So we we've actually I I, I could pull up a you know uh, a different presentation where we where we talk about that and and one of the papers I mentioned in the beginning. Um, Which is the cooling time scale? Right? This one, yeah, the cooling time scale. So this one, uh, pool at all. There's a series of three papers that talk about impact of mergers, and we're talking about major mergers. So we had three sets of clusters uh, with mass ratios of three to one, uh, uh, 10 to one, and one to one. So two clusters of equal mass banging together at different impact parameters. Uh, the only thing we did was we engineered them both with cool cores to start with. So if you are in a cool core state and you smash two clusters together, even if they're equal mass clusters and they're coming in at, you know, at relative velocities of a few thousand, it's not enough because, as, uh, as mentioned, the cooling in the center is very efficient. I, th I buy that, but what about if you're talking about a history in which before there's, you know, in the first few hundred million years or something, there's been a prospect of a major enough collision that you never establish a cool core structure. Yeah. So, so, so that 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 most simulations already capture, right? The the simulations we have today already capture that kind of uh, history. Doesn't work. You certainly don't get 50%. What you do get is that when the clusters are disturbed, you get them in this strange phase, but a very small fraction. Usually, about 15 to 20% of the clusters are in this disturbed phase, and they are disturbed. If you looked at them with observations, you'd, they'd look disturbed, and so that's not surprising. 
hydrostatic equilibrium calculation should not be applied to those clusters in the first place. Um, but as soon as they start to relax, they relax right back into the cool core state. The radiation is, radiated processes are very efficient in the, in the cores of these clusters. Okay, so once you get to a, a non-cool core or a hot core, then the time scale is wrong. Then the time scale is right. So if, yeah, if you get, that's right. Yeah, get, but getting to that state. That's right. That's right. And so. But you have to keep it at that state. That's what's the problem. Right? No, if, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're already in a non-cool core state and you're relaxed and you have a non-cool core, then the central cooling time is 5 billion years. It's very long. And so merge, if you have non-cool core clusters and you merge clusters, you just keep heating the gas. So non-cool core clusters and non-cool core cluster mergers just keep heating the gas because the cooling time scales are so long that the entropy that, and, and, the, and the shocks that build up just keeps building the cluster. Exactly. I was just thinking something related to Cole's question. Um, <coughs> now, you, so you mentioned the fact that there's been a lot of progress in modern star formation, but actually it's like the much better results in the galaxy simulations. We've seen most of them. But now the question is, from, from that point of view, we know that the way that star formation and feedback is implemented now by different groups, different ways, but that gets these better results. Also means that in, in a way, you know, the thermodynamical state of the gas is different from outputs in the old Yes. Direction. Yes. And now I wonder, you know, that is of the galaxy scale. And the cluster simulations are not yet capable of resolving that scale at which you can really you know, do star formation in molecular clouds. Or, so yeah. So the question is, how do we know that we're not screwing up the thermodynamical state of the gas from so that was my, so that was, yeah, yeah. So that was my next answer: is that that mergers by itself does not will not do it. But if you manage to have outflows that are re realistic and reasonable, then as you track that hot expelled gas falling back into the halos, right? They are they are diffuse. They're 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 hot, and so as they fall back, they're being compressed and they're keeping their entropy more or less high. If you have successive mergers that are happening at the same time while their cooling times are long, then you can start to change the, the structure. Okay, and yeah. so the mixture of hierarchy and heating together okay, would, would play a role. And so, yes, so yeah, we've been, that, that's exactly the lines that, that we've been talking about that we're trying to figure out, you know, if you do the hierarchy right, can you get this model problem solved? But without doing the hierarchy right, just doing an isolated cluster is not going to solve the problem. Localized variable preheating is, is exactly what we were talking about. Yeah. So originally, we you know we started out with a toy model where we heated the entire universe, and it works, <laughs> right? Uh, if you heat everything, up, it never. So you can form the whole distribution. You can explain all the X-ray properties of clusters. Problem was, if you heat everything to 10 to the 6, your Lyman alpha clouds are disappearing. So you know the the next, and, and then if you look at if you look at the, the jets that are coming out of galaxies in the, and they're going out, you know, uh, hundreds of kiloparsecs and, and megaparsecs in some cases, if you are able to affect the gas in the halo, for example, in the Milky Way halo, Joel Brug Bregman was recently showing that, that most of the baryons, now that he can see them in x-rays, are still not there. They're, they're, they're outside the halo. That if you can heat enough gas like that and expel it, then if you can, when that gas falls in, as this hierarchy continues to build up, that will change this, the evolution along the lines that Lucio and, and Cole were just describing. So yeah, I think that you that's the picture. Yeah, you need a, you need to play this game properly in all the components from the beginning. Yeah, this stuff, the, the big stuff that I'm forming. Which one? No, oh, no, no. The, you, you know, the slide was for, the, for to show the image of what I'm thinking about. That's from Tom Thunes's uh, outflows of galaxies. Or, 
so when we, we, when we did, so I mean, again, this, it's a hierarchy problem. So you're looking at the building of galaxies. And if bulk of the galaxies are sort of being, you know, you're assembling galaxies from redshift 6 onwards, the, massive, the most massive galaxies are the ones that ought to be doing this. Right. Would also start, yeah. Yeah. Well, oh, no, I, I, agree. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I agree with that. But there isn't enough energy in the star formation unless you believe in a huge amount of intracluster light. So if you take the stars that you already see and you calculate the energetics from that, the metals come out right. But the, but the energy budget isn't there. Um, you can multiply that by a factor of two or three and claim that two thirds of the of the stars are in the intracluster light, and you are uh, you're still short by about 40 percent. If you multiply that to a factor of uh, I think 10, then you're starting to get close to the energy budget, and you know. So, really, it does become an energy budget problem. So this is one place where you know you, you unless you can find a more efficient way of blowing up stars, yeah. you're running into yeah. problems. It's, it's a hard problem, yeah. So this is a, sort of a test also with this idea. It's like, OK, let's keep it super simple, simplistic, maybe overly simplistic, but you still find that you can't. Well, I, I mean, I would caution you so against I that. I'll go back to Lucha's idea, because then, you know, how about the how would that well, I'm, I, yeah, so I, I, I wouldn't agree with that. What I would say is that. No, the, I mean, that's what we see. I'm not saying right. that. Right. No, but the cautionary note. I just see it. Right, but the cautionary note is that when we were doing star formation 15 years ago in a very simplistic fashion, it wasn't working. So the, if I turn your argument on its head, the argument is that if you're doing AGN formation in simplistic fashion, it may not be capturing the heating profile correctly. Sure, yeah, so that's, it's star, right? yeah, no, it's a star. No, I, I, absolute, I mean, absolutely, absolutely. But I, I don't think you can conclude much from that. Yes. So that's what I'm saying. You know, yeah, yeah. As you change a little bit of this information, yeah. maybe changes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, that's because it's enough. That, yeah. That's why the yeah. energy yeah. budget is an important argument, yeah. but it doesn't tell you the whole story. No, absolutely not. That's right. Absolutely not. And I think that because the effects are so nonlinear. Yeah. You know, even if the energy budget is driving you through AGN, right. tinkering with the with the way you do the AGN will change something completely dramatically. Yeah. Yeah. So where am I? Um, all right, alarms going off in about five minutes. Or in fact, actually, yeah, that's the point, right? What about magneto hydrogen clusters? I mean, I guess you haven't discussed conduction. I haven't discussed conduction. I am a. Yeah, I, I, I'm finding it very hard to believe conduction, and, 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 and I go back to uh, work that Ramesh and Nadia did, where when they, you know, when they did the conduction calculation, they were finding that the factor that you need to enhance the conductivity over Spitzer varies so dramatically from cluster to cluster that you're, you're you know, you're you're almost in a stochastic mode at that point. Sometimes you need, you know, 10, 15 times. Sometimes you need three times. Yeah. So they they were finding that, uh, if I remember correctly, they were finding that the the magnetic instability tends to orient the magnetic fields in a relaxed cluster in a tangential fashion, which actually prevents heat flowing into the cluster. And, and actually enhances cooling, and so you know, or not enhances, but allows cooling to run away, unless you have a merger that comes in and disturbs the magnetic fields, and, and then you can have a partially radial magnetic fields, which then allows the heat to flow in and all that. Uh, 
you know, it, it's an it's it's an interesting idea, and and uh, you know, we've discussed it with uh, with Bang often, but. Until something like that is actually run through uh, a cosmological simulation where you can actually see where, you know, the, the velocities are not that great. So if you have galaxy falling into clusters, they're not going to do anything. If you have groups falling in, you need massive groups to fall into clusters to start to stir gas. And so this, you know, was something that Marcus and I had a long discussion about when last year or a year and a half ago when we had the cluster workshop here. And he, he, you know, I'm about to speak on that, and and it, it pertains to this stuff, that Marcus. You, so going back to here, so if you, if I can put that conversation on hold for a second, it actually relates to what what I what I'm about to say here. So even in cool core clusters, when you have jets and you see the jets and you see the impact of the jets on the intracluster medium and you can work out the energetics and you know that there's you know some kind you can see shocks being driven into the gas into the gas you, you know that there's heating going on but the problem there is that with with the with most jet simulations jets are launched in 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 a, in, in a narrow cones and you have initially you have a a shock wave that expands out and turns into a spherical shock wave, but then very quickly starts to buckle along the equatorial plane. And you have cooling that comes in through the equatorial planes or perpendicular to the jet and swamps the black hole again. So you, you, you don't actually get rid of the cool core structure very easily, or you don't actually manage to efficiently heat in an isotropic fashion. So that was a, so that's a problem that, 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 that has been plaguing uh, jet simulations, and there are there there are a couple of ways that, that, that have been resolved, or there's one way that that has been resolved in, 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 in literature, and that's work by Gaspari and company who have done a really nice simulations the, where they've looked at variety of conditions and strengths of jets and and whatnot. What they find is that the case that they seem to settle on as their quintessential solution to the cluster problem are the ones where the jets are incredibly powerful. In fact, they are like 10 to the 45, 10 to the 46 ergs jets. They, they're only on 6 or 7% of the time, so the duty cycles are short. But they are very powerful jets, and they create tremendous turbulence. And they stir the gas, and the gas basically distributes that giant, that tremendous motion distributes the gas. And then, interestingly enough, when they do the hydrostatic calculation, they say, you know, let's let's apply the hydrostatic uh, uh, calculation to these clusters, and calculate what the what 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 mass you would predict from hydrostatic calculations versus what actual mass there is. You find discrepancies of order factors of uh, I think it was so you, you could you would over predict or under predict by factors of two. Now we don't see that. We just don't see that in clusters. And, and people who've tried to measure turbulence uh, in, in clusters uh, find turbulence of order 200 kilometers per second, 300, maybe pushing it to 400 kilometers per second, but you don't see you know, uh, 1,000 kilometers per second uh, eddies. Now, in, there, is, there is an indication that some, you know, nature has, has managed to solve this problem in, 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 a, in a fashion uh, if one wants to. Uh, believe that. Well, first of all, before I do that, cooling is not quenched. It's only tempered. There's still gas trickling in there. And in every BCG in a cool core cluster, there's star formation going on. And there's a lot of molecular gas, 10 to the 10 solar masses of molecular gas. There's star formation going on at rates of 10 solar masses to, to uh, you know, 100 solar masses. It's not the 1,000 solar masses that we, we thought of before, but it's still going on. These are not red and dead. Uh, and, they, and sometimes these gal galaxies are forming stars and are sufficiently blue that they don't sit on the red sequence. So any attempt to dis, you know, find BCGs by color selection can run into trouble unless your box around the red sequence is broad enough. So that's, a, that's something I just wanted to mention. But the isotropy problem is a vexing problem. And um, I have to say, I didn't actually plot up the, pro maybe I didn't put up the best pictures around that they are. But this is uh, M87. You can see the jets are changing directions. Uh, you can argue that that, that, that that jet could be turning because of turbulence. On slightly larger scales, uh, 
Foreman and company have argued that there are a whole sequence of bubbles that are, that are being created. And then on, on very large scales in, ra in radio, you, see, you can see the structure. There's a jet that's actually larger than this. So this feature is actually sitting out here. There's a jet-like feature. There's a jet. The jet. This is the present-day jet. There is the slightly older jet direction. And then there is a slightly older jet direction. And now you can argue that turbulence, again, in a cluster environment, can move these bubbles around. And, but there are, there are two problems with moving these bubbles around, especially large bubbles like this. First of all, they're collinear. That means you have large rotational eddies. You're, you're not just doing turbulence. You're not just moving these things around any old fashion. You're actually rotating them about the center. And in fact, in Perseus, there are something of order uh, five or six generations of bubbles. And they're all collinear. You can, you know, when Andy Fabian dates them, he finds bubble counter bubble. And they're basically collinear. They just look like they're rotating. The rotational, so you know, they, the number of directional changes that are seen, we see them in Perseus, we see them in Virgo, we see them in this, in this cluster that I mentioned before, the CLO9, the, 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 the quasar at the center of, the obscured quasar at the center of a, of a cluster. Uh, depending on how you count these changes, whether you want to count these small scale changes, there are between five to eight directional changes. <clears throat> They range from small scale jets where the velocities in the jets are sufficiently powerful that you need equal amount of turbulence to actually move the jet around unless you are invoking uh, wiggling on angles of order 20 degrees. So you can, you can measure the, the, the changes in angles in the plane of the sky at least. And you're looking at changes of order 20 to 60 degrees in the plane of the sky. The mean, there's a distribution of time scales. The, the sort of the mean time scale between changes appears to be about 20 mega years. And that's consistent between M87 and Perseus. Uh, this one we haven't looked at very carefully in that sense because there's only one, two, two directional changes that, that we've seen. And it's not difficult. It's very difficult to, to time the changes. Yeah. Yeah. So they are low power. They are not the standard jet. That we, I mean, they are not powerful jet that deposit most of the energy in the in the, in, in the hot spots. These are objects in which the jet fades away by itself. And all, very often, it's not just here. It does things, and we know these jets are in trains, and we know that a lot of the wiggles have to do with interaction. These are just a very interaction with with with, this, with the dense ambient gas. Yeah, this is it's you know these are weak jets in, in very dense environments. And, and uh, you know, the energetics and the way the velocity structure is. In most cases, people have studied this at, at greater details and have found lots of entrainment and a lot, a lot of, of interaction. Of but the, the interaction, right. The, it's plausible that that's there. The interactions that I've, the, the interaction, the wiggles that I've seen on the jets do not change directions by 60 degrees. The, that's, a, that's a large but angle changes. Seven, the jet proper, as very small wiggles within the, I mean, within the galaxy itself. No, within yeah, the within the jet, it's, you, can, you can argue this is a wiggle, right. but this is very hard to wiggle. Well, okay, this is, this is not a jet. I mean, what you're looking in that is like buoyant bubbles. Yeah, then but the buoyant bubbles. No, no, I'm, I'm not saying they're relativistic, but they have to be created in some way. They're created by jet counter jet, and now you have to move them around. Right. Well, you, if you want to move them around. But again, if you look at the, the radio picture, don't forget the 3D thing. I mean, the, the, the M87 yeah. jet is more or less 30 degrees away from our line of sight. So we are looking at two, two bubbly things with a quite strong difference in, 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 in depth. I mean, the, the, the south, the south uh, you know, the, the, in the lower right is next to us, and the other one is in the back. So the 3D structure is very complicated. And the 3D structure in Perseus has been done really well by uh, Dunn and <laughs> Dunn and Fabian, where they've actually looked at the 3D, attempted to do the 3D calculation properly. And in Perseus, you'll find the same thing. You, you'll find large angle changes. Um, I'll show you a picture very quickly right in a second that, that, that may, you know, that to me was more convincing than. No, I, mean, I, I definitely agree that when you, when you, when you are on 10 of kiloparsec scales, these bubbles do show large changes. Right. Uh, right. So sometimes these are complicated. To no, no, I, I, I agree with you. So, I mean, yeah, yeah. 
they are complex environments, and I think that, that you know, it's an open question. Um, I completely agree with that. The, the, the arguments that I will pose to you are twofold. One is that you need, if you want to move these bubbles around, so Marcus has done simulations of moving these bubbles around. And Mar, you know, when, when we parse through his simulations, to get these bubbles, for example, in M87 to change directions by that much, you needed something of order 700 to 800 kilometers per second turbulence. And then getting collinear shifts was not, was not possible. So you can go back in this paper and look at that. And, and you need major mergers to trigger that. OK, Virgo is a merging system. <clears throat> so I guess I'm and so we have, yeah. So if you, if you think about a situation where just the jet direction is changing. Yeah. Okay, so initially, it's coming this way. Then it shifts. You push, you push the hot spots out, and you also get this big blowback. So a great deal of that plasma is the, is the returning deaccelerated particles. Yeah. And then in the inside, the jet changes direction. Now right. it's going this way, and you make some bubbles over here. The point is you haven't moved any large-scale structure at all. That's right. So, so it's not like you're taking a, you know, a dumbbell and rotating it. No, but the other picture is that you are, you, you, what you're doing is. You're only rotating right. things on very small scales. Right. So if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you want to move the jets around, then you're absolutely right, which is the picture, I, which, which is what I would argue. But the, the, the alternative is that you're, the jet is still going off in one direction and static, but then these bubbles are being inflated over here and then being moved around by velocity flows in a large uh, intercluster medium. So all sorts of complicated you know, hydrodynamics. A merger comes in, it's going to stir this thing up. And the bubbles are very light. So they will move around. And Marcus has done these simulations. And the problem he finds is that if you want to move the bubbles sufficiently, on, once they get out to tens and thirties of 30 kiloparsec scales, you need very large velocities. So you need velocities of order you know, 600 to 800 kilometers per second, which can only be triggered by a major merger. So then you would expect that every time you see a bubble changing direction, you are, have invoked a major merger. Um, they don't last very long, these velocities. And so in, place, in places like Perseus, you can actually you see multiple generations of bubbles. And in principle, you can interpret that as a major merger history of Perseus. Or you can take your, the picture you just argued, which is the jet is changing direction, which is, which is what we did. Um, so you know, I'm not going to discuss this any, uh, in detail, because Cole went through this. Yeah. It's a buoyancy time scale that you that you get from rice time. Sorry. So the 20 megahertz, most of the time scale is being dominated by the bubbles. We see bubbles, and we see the bubbles at different heights, and you can estimate the rise time. That's an, that, well, it's, it's an observationally determined estimate. There, there are three different time scales, and they vary. You know, they vary by. A, I, I wouldn't consider this pinned down to factors of two. It's not a billion years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we, we did um, local observation, and we time using simple domains. Yeah, so you can. We come up exactly. I mean, between 10 and 40 mega years for the structure. Right. So that so there are radio observations too. Yeah, um, I should have mentioned that. So in these cool core clusters, you have filaments, cool filaments sitting there, which are, some of them are falling back in, some of them are not falling back in, are rising out, whatever. It's a complicated situation in the center. What we were arguing, and, and, and uh, um, Hobbes and Andrew King and company have also argued for ballistic accretion. So you know, now I'm, I'm putting on my complete theorist hat and saying, how can I get these jets to change directions? And in this paper, which I uh, point to you, we had these. We, we argued that if you know, if you had material falling off from either the updraft of a previous jet, so that the material came back down this way and formed a disk, more or less uh, off-axis from the jet itself, or you had these uh, thermal instabilities of the kind that uh, Gaspari and uh, Matus and 
Pratik Sharma and Ian Parrish have looked at, you get the same thing. You have uh, blobs of material and, and filamentary structure falling in. You only need something of order as, you know, essentially as Cole was telling us, you need something of order 10 to the 6 to the 10 to the 7 solar masses of stuff falling into, the, into an accretion disk that's misaligned to be able to start to change direction. And the directional changes are uh, fairly fast. This is a 6 billion solar mass black hole. So for yeah, so uh, for for three billion solar masses, we were needing about ten to the seven solar masses of, of gas so in a disk. Uh, so it depends. So that's where it gets tricky. It depends on the spin of the black hole. So if it's a very low spinning black hole, it's easier to to, to tilt. Uh, if it's a high spinning, and tougher to imagine that you're getting a jet, oh, unless you're getting a jet out of the disk. Or even regular, and regular. Don't have power to that. Exactly, I, I completely agree with that. So the picture we are advocating is that that most of the time the jet is sitting, the black hole is sitting there at low accretion rate and firing jets. Okay. Once in a while you get just blobs falling in. It shuts off, effectively shuts off the radio mode, excuse me, and turns into a quasar. And you know, while it's radiating as a quasar, it's got a misaligned disk. It tilts. And then when the, when the disk is consumed, it turns on again, and the jets reestablish re themselves. Yeah, you have to switch between the two modes. In a, you know, I mean, I'm sure it's more complicated than that, uh, but you know, essentially, in a, in a nutshell, that's the picture. So you, you end up with a short-lived quasar while you are doing the tilt. So what fraction of VCGs should we expect to see quasars in? So in the paper, we worked it out in, 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 in careful detail. Um, we expect 5% duty cycles for, for quasars, uh, for clusters, which within a Z of 0.5 turns out to be one to two clusters you would expect to have a quasar in them. Um, fortuitously, and I, you know, I, I'm not sure whether we contrived it in this fashion or not. Um, you know, I plead the fifth in, the, in some sense. Um, it, there are actually two quasars in, in BCGs. There is, a, there is the HG system that Andy Fabian found at redshift of 0.2, and then there is the redshift of 0.4 system that we have. One is a naked quasar, and one is the obscured quasar. And those are the only two quasars in a BCG at the center. So, you know, from a duty cycle, time scale argument, things work. Uh, we don't get 60 degree changes in any one shot. We can get maximum of 30 degree changes, but we need spins of 0.1 to get a 30 degree change at any one 10 to the 7 solar mass. What says 30 degrees? Um, that's, that's basically the mass of the disk. We, we were cutting off the disk to the radius at which star formation will start setting in. So if the gas disk is bigger than the radius at which it becomes self-gravitating, we don't count the material outside. You might be able to glue that. So, it, so I, are you doing a sure curve in the this? Yeah. If you add a little turbulence into things or some partial star formation that can stir things up, you might be able to get more than that. Yeah, so that's, that, that's one idea. And the other is because we have a warp disk, we took m dot to be the m dot of the sta stable Sakura whereas m dot actually increases in the warp disk, if I'm not mistaken. So we, yeah, you're right. We could probably get away with a little bit more than that. So, um, all right, I am at, I'm running way over. Um, I'll stop with this one. I think this is a, a really neat system. Uh, Unfortunately, it's only one of its kind um, in a cluster. So it's a it's a obscured quasar, a Heilerg system that's sitting at the center of a cool core cluster. Uh, it has a radio jet, 
it's a, uh, the, the extent of the radio jet in one direction, uh, the radius is something of order uh, 60 kiloparsecs. This is 60 kiloparsecs, fairly straight uh, jet. And yet the direction of the quasar appears to be different. Now, uh, if I haven't plotted this up, but there is a, there is a, a second radio lobe system in the very center that's puffed up now. Uh, and it's in the different direction. It's in fact coincident with the direction of the ionization cones that we have here. Uh, this one is what makes me think that turbulence is not doing much. Because if there was large scale turbulence in these kinds of systems, and this system has actually had a merger. We see that. In x-rays, we see spiral structures coming in. Uh, we have filaments that are metal rich, which can only happen if you have, you, either you've lifted stuff out uh, from the center of the galaxy or you're shredding something that was already um, coming in in a galaxy. The kinematics seems to suggest that this was a recent, um, not a recent merger, but a, a, a relaxing merger. The velocity fields haven't managed to do anything to the jet. So that's one thing that seems to suggest. We have GMRT data on, on the jet and have done the, the radio aging. And the jet is, is basically not, hasn't been energized uh, in the last 200 million years. 200 million years is roughly the time scale when the star formation started. So when you do population synthesis, you look at the youngest stellar populations, the ages are about 200 million years. Uh, so it seems to suggest that there was something interesting happened here. And the, the one thing I would like to leave you with is that we have deep Chandra data. So we have been able to look at what's happening to the intracluster gas as far in as uh, about 14 kiloparsecs. And so if this thing is blowing winds, that those winds are not getting out to 14 kiloparsecs because we see no shocks, nothing happening at 14 kiloparsecs or further. Whether it's happening within, we'll find out uh, shortly because we have Gemini uh, IFU data um, in the pipeline. So we will hopefully find out what's happening in the very center. There is a 1,000 kilometer nuclear outflow. So that wind is thermalizing somewhere. And how much mass is that wind carrying is, again, hasn't been resolved. Um, but clearly, it's not having a feedback. So the quasar mode feedback is not doing anything to the cluster. Except perhaps serving. Except perhaps at the very, except perhaps tilting the jet. Yeah. And and it may may be responsible for the tilt that we've just observed. So I think having isotropic heating is necessary in groups. It actually becomes worse in groups because groups have a much shorter cooling time in the centers. So yes, the answer, short answer is yes. I, yeah. I haven't worked it out myself in detail, but I am agnostic leaning on disbelief <laughs> oh, to that. And, and you know, um, I mean, there have been similar claims made for star formation and starburst. And you know that Phil Hopkins gets different results from um, the other groups. And <laughs> The problem there is that if you're not coupling your energy very, you know, in the right way, you can easily dissolve cusps because you are you can become over efficient very easily. And the way star formation is being done today, it's not entirely clear. I mean, Phil and company who are starting to get the highest resolution and are not doing things like decoupling winds and whatnot 
are not seeing the cusp dissolve. So whether this happens in, a, in an AGN or not is, you know, is, it, I haven't sat down and worked out the actual energetics and, and find out whether you're expelling enough material. What I do know is that radio AGNs, so a typical BCG in a, in a cluster, in a full core cluster, has 10 to the 10 solar masses of molecular gas sitting there. So that quasar, that, that not quasar, that radio AGN is really not doing very much to the gas that's already sitting there. It, it's halting the stuff that, that, that have come. And so that leads to another completely interesting problem. It's growing around 90% of the gas. If it's supposed to I don't think it's throwing it out. I think it's suppressing the gas from coming in. What, what is interesting and, right, yeah. What is interesting and what I am puzzled by and you know, I'm still struggling with is that when you have mass loss from the old stellar population, you can account for the 10 to the 10 solar masses of molecular gas, which makes me think, why is that gas not feeding the black hole? Well, it's too hot, right? Well, it, so is it in? Well, you know, we're the So it'd be 10 to the six. So 400 kilometers per second, right? So you're looking at uh, close to 10 to the 7. No, not 10 to the 8. It's not 10 to the 8. It's 10 to the 7 because you're looking at 400 kilometers per. But it's 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 not hot. It's not hotter than the intra-cluster medium gas that we are invoking to feed the black hole through on Bondi accretion time scales. So the Bondi accretion should be much higher, right? No, 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 but I'm, you know, what I'm thinking is, is, that, is the intracluster medium really the source of the fuel for the AGN, even in the radio mode? Mm -hmm. There are two yeah. methods under the moment to dispose of some yeah. of magnitude to unreasonable to control. These are spherical systems. They shock very efficiently. But I mean, still, even if it's, seven, I mean, the, even a tiny amount of under momentum on, on the radio with the scale for the black hole is huge. Yeah. It's in the, but we don't know whether the but 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 you know something like a hundred or two hundred kilometers per second turn rotation on on a cluster scale is a huge amount of angular momentum when it fall, flows in. So any calculation of Bondi accretion which does not do angular momentum is already an ad hoc calculation. Well, the fish, it's a question of how, how, you know, what fuel you're coupling into the black hole and, and what is actually, and how you're getting it there. Yeah, yeah. There's a hell of a lot of fuel. All right, I'll stop here. <laughs>